Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, thanks uh, so much for coming to this info session on the Public Scholars Initiative, or should I say the award-winning Public Scholars Initiative. We just found out last week that uh, we won a really um, great award from a North American uh, association related to graduate education for this and some other initiatives that um, we're sponsoring to um, gear towards broad and career uh, preparation and outcomes for PhD students. So we were really thrilled about that. Uh, my name is Jenny Phelps. I'm here with uh, our team. That's um, the leadership of the Public Scholars Initiative. I'll just kick us off to um, say a little bit about what we'll be covering today. Um, our Dean and Vice Provost of Graduate Studies, Dr. Susan Porter, is going to talk a little bit about uh, where this initiative came from and why we think it's important. Uh, then uh, F.A. Pater and I will talk a bit about the components of the initiative, what it means to be involved with it, what are the um, uh, different kind of support services and other components of being a participant uh, in the Public Scholars Initiative. Uh, we have a couple of our scholars uh, from this first year here with us today, Anna, Leah, and uh, Sarah, who are going to say a few words about their experience with uh, the initiative this year. Uh, then we will um, talk some nuts and bolts about um, actually applying for the initiative, what we're looking for, what the criteria are, um, and what you need to include in your application. Uh, I think we'll have plenty of time uh, for questions and answers as we go along. Uh, if you have a burning question that you want to ask as, as we're going, feel free to raise your hand uh, or save it till the end and uh, we'll uh, converse at that point. Okay, I'll turn it over to Susan. Thanks very much, Jenny. Um, just out of interest, how many people have heard about this initiative for the first time during this communication email around this session? Okay, great. Um, so I'll, I'll uh, talk a little bit about the background. Some of you would probably f be familiar with it already. Um, so about, well, several years ago, we at the University of British Columbia, in fact, many universities around the world have been having conversations around the PhD degree. Um, in particular, and this, there's been a number of reasons why we're having this conversation. Um, one is that the degree was created in the, well, the modern degree was created in the early 19th century primarily as a way for um, the university to regenerate itself, so uh, to regenerate the professoriate. That is no longer the case. That's no longer the, those are no longer the, usual, the majority outcomes from PhD graduates. And in fact, it probably somewhere around 30% um, end up in tenure track positions. So it's worthwhile, we think, and many people think, rethinking what the PhD can be and how it can best prepare students for the diversity of careers that are out there. Um, it, at the same time as we're looking at um, the diverse kinds of scholarship that you graduates will do in the real world, wherever that is, in the academy and out, we're also seeing a change in the academy itself and the types of scholarship that faculty are doing at the university. Um, more, um, more scholarship around teaching and learning, more scholarship that is applied, more scholarship that is engaged with the community. Um, and so this is the types of scholarship that we're looking at this initiative that is helpful only, that is changing also at the university and in the careers that you'll be, that, and is relevant for the careers that you'll be undertaking. We also know that there's granting agency and government interest in impact. Um, and there, for good reason, I think there is a need for innovation. There is a need for new knowledge, but there's also a need to put that new knowledge into action to make a change in the world. And we also know from, partly from uh, Dr. Phelps's PhD thesis itself, that students themselves, we know, have a strong interest in making an impact. And this is, uh, and we've heard that from many of the students uh, that are involved in this, that they really want to make a difference. And this is a way for them to do that. So the goals of the Public Scholar Initiative is, are these, I think, somewhat succinctly here. Uh, to think about doctoral education more broadly, and it's, it's not only PhDs, we are including DMAs and EDDs in this. But the idea is that they would, students would gain experience in the environments and types of scholarship that they 
that they will engage in. So getting not just skills, not just a workshop, but actual experience in the types of work that they could be doing, not, not necessarily a specific, but in a broader context. Um, there we, ideally, uh, the work that you do as a scholar in these contexts should be evaluated as part of the degree. Not only ensuring it's really a good work, in other words, it's not just something that you do and no one really cares how good it is. We actually care how good it is and how scholarly it is and how rigorous it is. But it also signals that the university thinks these types of scholarship are worthy and worthy of a degree. Um, we also, on a very pragmatic sense, we like the, the fact that non-academic partners would appreciate the value of what PhDs bring. I think that is one of the issues that, is, that is, keeps bubbling up in this conversation about PhDs in, in careers is that sometimes employers don't really know what PhDs are about or value them. So this is a way to integrate specifically into those environments and show what PhDs are capable of um, and gen general perception of the, of the doctor. And then, of course, as we've talked about, contributing to the public good is a, is a wonderful thing that we, we want this, uh, that is a goal of this, this initiative. So then the question is, well, what, what public scholarship? We, we, we didn't initially come to the idea that this was public scholarship, but as we began to look at what we were envisioning, um, we realized this is a good term for this, and we, we've tried to define it very broadly in that um, here's the definition that we've come up with. So the idea is that there are partnerships, ideally, um, with university knowledge and the external, or even internal to the university, um, to contribute to the public good through, and hopefully involving mutually beneficial ideas. So it, there's one aspect of public scholarship of having new knowledge at the university and then translating that into the, to the world. That's, that's good. But that's one, only one aspect, perhaps arguably uh, even more uh, closer to the concept of public scholarship is that the external partners in the university work on a mutually inter mutual subject of interest. They're both interested in the results. They both work, they're really collaborative rather than it just in one way. It's a two way. So ultimately, of course, uh, the ideas of what is public good, enriching knowledge, very broadly what we, we view as public good. Educating the public is a public good. Inciting intellectual curiosity and wonder is a public good. Enhancing curriculum, it could be within the university, it doesn't have to be outside. Um, preparing educated citizens and helping solve critical problems. These are all elements of uh, what, what we would consider public good and public scholarship. Okay, so I've just given some background. Now you'll hear a little bit more about the nuts and bolts, as Jenny said, of the program itself. So. Any guys for the? Yeah. Hi everybody. As uh, Susan or Jenny introduced, I, my name is Efe, and I'm the coordinator of the Public Scholars Initiative. And I'm a PhD candidate myself, so uh, I know how some of you may be feeling overall throughout the PhD experience in a way uh, that PSI speaks to. So um, I'll just begin by talking about this Venn diagram that you may have seen in the event announcements. Um, doctoral education intersecting with broader career readiness and purposeful social contribution. I think we should begin by highlighting that PSI is not reinventing the wheel. It's not doing anything that PhD scholars are already do, uh, uh, it's not doing anything that PhD students aren't already doing in their in their doctoral uh, throughout their doctoral education. One of them is of course um, purposeful social contribution. Many of you and it's not limited to this room uh, are carrying out research that is making a positive impact directly or indirectly to the world. And, uh, and some people are more aware of this and some others are not. What PSI is intending to do is to encourage and highlight the idea of purposeful social contribution as a component of the PhD experience itself. And another thing that we're already doing is preparing ourselves for broader career readiness or preparing ourselves for broader careers. So. Um, one statistic that revolves around is 
um, about 30% of PhD holders in Canada continue within academia at the end of the day. So there's one way of looking at this. Oh my God, it's 30%, so we're doomed, we'll be unemployed. It's a horrible future for us. Um, and the other way of looking at this is, well, how about those 70%? So uh, what about the amazing things, amazing contributions that those people are doing outside of academia, but still using all the skills, all the formation that they've gathered throughout their doctoral education? So I think we should have a positive outlook towards this and see that 70% as what our PhDs can bring to us. And overall, this intersection of these two elements with the doctoral education, we believe that it increases the value of doctoral education itself. Uh, I gave this example yesterday as well. You might have seen that Simpsons episode where Bart Simpson talks about PhD students. Has anyone seen that? Um, so he's making fun of PhD students and uh, Marge intervenes, look Bart, uh, they're not, uh, PhDs are not bad people, they've just made horrible life choices. <laughs> uh, so, um, one reason, um, one reason for us for being um, overly critical of what we're doing, I think comes from the fact that our training teaches us to be critical of everything. That's why we direct that um, critical perspective to, our, uh, to ourselves and then say, oh my God, we're doomed. So, um, but PSI is intending uh, to use those critical skills in a way, in a positive way, so that uh, the value of doctoral education can be understood, first of all by ourselves, by PhD candidates themselves, but also uh, by the larger world, as, as Susan mentioned. Um, I don't think um, people outside of academia are fully aware of what PhD candidates are doing and what, uh, what kind of potential they have to contribute to the world. So this is pretty much, I would say, the summary of what PSI is intending to achieve. <clears throat> and PSI has three components, uh, the Public Scholars Network, um, and it provides academic support and also funding. Um, last year we began uh, with a call for applications and 98 people overall applied and 39 of them were selected for the first class or cohort of the Public Scholars Initiative. And we had a chance to put these three components to a test and uh, look for ways to develop them based on, the, uh, based on the feedback coming from the students themselves. So let me begin by talking about the Public Scholars Network. The network, first of all, uh, allows for promotion and visibility for the PSI scholars. I'll, do, I'll just do a quick visit. Yes, I want to continue. A uh, quick visit to uh, the PSI website. It is taking time, apparently. Well, while that opens, I'll just begin talking about the website itself. Oh, there you are. So we do have the Venn diagram everywhere. And then, um, the website, along with introductions, what PSI is about, its background, and so on, and these are the uh, PSI scholars uh, from, from this year's cohort. <clears throat> but PSI scholars are featured, but their profiles are featured on the website. And if we go to one of them here, so it's not just about your photo and what you do, these are, are of course there, but also some answers to the questions such as, what does being a public scholar mean? In what ways do you think the PhD experience can be reimagined with the Public Scholars Initiative? Or how do you envision connecting your PhD work with broader career possibilities? So we're inviting to the students to think with us uh, on how we can reimagine the PhD, which is um, our not-so-secret agenda. 
Um, in addition to the profiles, we also provide, let's go back here. We have a what's new section uh, of upcoming PSI events, but also a blog section. So many of us, when we're talking about our research, we usually have difficulty explaining what the research is about to a non-expert audience. Because when we're asked the question, uh, in our minds, we're always speaking to our supervisors. And we're using those fancy words uh, in some ways we can hide behind sometimes, at least I do. Um, in order to come up with explanations that are not readily accessible to a larger audience. What the PSI blog section is intending to do is to receive, um, um, receive a draft blog from you and then with several back, back and forths uh, try to make that more accessible to a larger audience. I think um, Sarah would be able to speak to that. She was getting frustrated with me and uh, <laughs> some of us. But at the end, um, this came out to be uh, uh, why community engagement matters in addressing climate change. And I think it turned out to be a very accessible and very informative piece at the same time. You might want to mention how um, with the profiles, many of our scholars have used that to help communicate with um, other um, potential collaborators about the type of work they're doing. And it's really helped them raise their profile to be able to direct people um, to this information on the, on the web and you know, people have found them through web searches and they've made a lot of interactions with potential collaborators and others through their profiles on the site. Exactly, and uh, I'll briefly mention uh, a bit, uh, a few more things about that. Um, with regard to the PhDs go public events. Uh, before that, I'll just quickly mention the email list uh, that we have in a, in a Facebook group for PSI um, to share relevant information at events. So when you become a part of the network, um, it's, it's my job to find interesting things for you that you may benefit, uh, benefit from, uh, because I listen to your research, and we do, um, and uh, try to understand what, where you're coming from and helping, uh, intending to provide support for you in relation to what your goals are. Um, and our main, I would say, public events are what we call the PhDs Go public events. So um, in the past, we've done uh, an event on culture and education and innovation, and three upcoming events uh, are on the agenda. One of them is on sustainability, which is uh, the Friday uh, after this week, so 18th of March. Another one is on health, March 24th. And the other one is uh, local and indigenous communities, uh, April 28th. So what happens in these events is that, well, we have 39 scholars at the moment, and there are five events. So it's roughly seven to eight scholars per event, finding a chance to present their work, again, in a way that is accessible to non-experts. Because we mix uh, the scholars and place them uh, scholars from different backgrounds into the same group so that it's a very interdisciplinary uh, group and the audience is, not, is a non-expert audience as well. And um, we're encouraging the use of uh, this dynamic presentation format known as Pecha Kucha. Uh, who's heard of that format? Okay, quite a few of you. So um, Pecha Kucha format is 20 slides times 20 seconds and you have 6 minutes and 40 seconds to present but the trick is that uh, as 20 seconds suggest you have no control over uh, how the slides move forward every 20 seconds the slide continues so um, and we do rehearsals before every event and the idea is to present a, uh, a brief dynamic but at the same time informative presentation to a public audience and um, we record these talks as well, and then with the images and the sound, I edit them together, and then we place them on the website so that um, there's more visibility for your projects uh, out there in the world. And uh, that's what Jenny was mentioning earlier. A uh, few of the students were picked up by mm -hmm. UBC Public Affairs, and then they told us that they were contacted by some quite big uh, external uh, partners. Uh, who showed interest in their projects, and that was a networking opportunity for them. 
And to these events themselves, we're uh, making a point of inviting people, not only from the university, but also whoever external partner that may be interested, that may be relevant for that particular event, uh, so as to provide a networking opportunity. And uh, another component of the network is professional development workshops. So uh, Susan mentioned uh, the fact that more and more universities are realizing that we have to do something with this changing reality. That is, a great majority of PhD holders are going and seeking for jobs elsewhere. And uh, the mainstream answer to that question in the last decade or two has been professional development workshops. And at UBC here, we have an excellent program, um, Graduate Pathways to Success, I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, that provides workshops so that you can, uh, that can assist your professional development. Um, what PSI is doing is perhaps seeking to take it a step further by integrating professional development as a component of your, uh, as a component of your PhD, if not the dissertation itself. So in the past, uh, we had a workshop about telling stories about your research, again, speaking to larger audiences, and we had a faculty panel on public scholarship um, in which we invited different um, faculty, uh, professors from different faculties to talk about and uh, ask them to talk about public scholarship, and um, it appeared to us very quickly that it looks quite different across disciplines. Um, and some of the planned workshops for this year and next year are on policy making and the relationship between industry and academia, and uh, film and research, community-based research, ethics, and so on. And uh, what we're intending to do is to customize these uh, professional development workshops based on what the students are asking us. So uh, it's not a standardized program, but it's um, building up based on the feedback coming from the students. <clears throat> and secondly, there's the academic support aspect of PSI, um, and particularly for novel forms of scholarship. So um, this entails proactive consulting on standards of rigor, methodologies, integration of work in thesis, and comprehensive exams. So as I mentioned, our not-so-secret agenda is reimagining the PhD, and that means having a larger conversation with different actors within and outside of academy, uh, but especially within the academy, um, about how we can um, make that happen. So how can the comprehensive exams, for instance, be changed so that they're more conducive to your career perspectives, broader career perspectives? Or how about integrating um, an artifact into your dissertation? and we have, many of our scholars are already doing this, um, integrating a new and innovative form of artifact in your dissertation that would be evaluated as part of your dissertation. Let's say a policy paper. Um, we have a student who's recording an album, for instance, another one doing an exhibition, another one make, uh, working on film, um, a web tool for science communication, um, a conference for science communication, and so on. So the idea is that um, these things, many of us might want to do these things on the, as a side project of what we're doing, but uh, we feel that it would be much better for, our, for the students' formation if we could integrate them into the doctoral work and uh, have them evaluated as part of the doctoral work. So this conversation may also be about allowing a wider range of supervisory committee members. So if you feel like there's an external partner out there that knows so much about your research and can comment on the content of your work, um, they're an expert on the topic, but they're not full-time professors. So um, why shouldn't we be able to allow them to be a part of the committee if that there's a good justification for it and if um, you feel like, and your committee feels like, this is good for the uh, for, for dissertation, academic formation, and broader career uh, perspectives. <clears throat> and finally, there's the uh, question of uh, the external examiner. So we may convince everybody here, and then the dissertation goes to the ex external examiner, and it's a comic book. 
So, and this actually happened. There's a comic book dissertation. Um, so what's going to happen in that situation? And um, we're thinking of perhaps uh, having a letter sent to the external saying that at UBC we're supporting traditional as well as broader forms of scholarship uh, so that there's institutional support for this kind of work that you may intend to do. Um, the third aspect uh, is funding. The third component of PSI is funding and Jenny will talk more about that. But before we move on to that, I just want to say that um, number one and number two, as I listed here, uh, I feel like they're as important as the funding aspect. So you, have, you may become a part of the PSI network and benefit from all these things that I mentioned uh, without getting funding. So uh, perhaps they're as valuable as money. And now more about money. <laughs> uh, before I get into this, were there any, anybody have any quick questions on the network or academic support elements FA just talked about? No. Okay, so um, yes, the, the opportunity for getting funding may have attracted um, some attention for you. So um, just a little bit about this aspect of the initiative. Um, we are able to give up to $10,000 per successful student. And the, the goal of this funding is to support students to do these innovative forms of scholarship that, they, that you would otherwise be unable to do with your current funding source. So um, it's, um, it's meant to allow you to expand the work that um, you want to do into a new area, um, and especially in the case when you don't already have funding to do it or you weren't already planning on doing it with your current funding source. Um, this funding can be used um, for a stipend um, if your current funding doesn't cover um, the time that it would take um, uh, or the purpose of your work uh, to do this uh, alternative or additional project. Um, it can also be used for um, a research allowance to cover costs associated uh, with the, your publicly engaged work. Um, and that could include uh, travel, uh, travel for conferences or travel for research, travel for research collaborations. Uh, we think that we'll be able to award up to 30 new students uh, for the coming year. Uh, we're hoping that there will be a possibility for a renewal of second year of funding. Um, maybe we should have mentioned at the beginning that we're in year, we're going into year two of a two-year pilot. So we had this year and next year, and that's all we have guaranteed funding for right now. Big part of what we're working on right now is trying to identify ongoing funding source so we can keep this initiative moving forward and um, get more students involved with it. But for right now, we only have funding for the coming year. Uh, as far as eligibility goes, all, um, all doctoral level students um, uh, at UBC are eligible, PhD, EDD, and DMA, um, uh, and you have to be in years one through five during the funding period. Okay? So if you're in your fifth year now and you're going to be going into your sixth year, unfortunately you, you would not be eligible for, for funding. Any questions about that? No. Okay, well, I'll, we'll talk uh, more about details of how to actually do the application and what we're looking for in a little bit. But next we're going to hand it over to two of our scholars for this year to share a little bit of their reflections on their experience. Mm -hmm. Which one of you would like to go first? <laughs> Anna Leah Hildalgo from Forestry. Okay. Hello, everyone. Oh, there's more people than what I thought. <laughs> Would you like to step up? Yeah, okay. So, um, we were invited um, to speak a little bit about what we do and how being part of the initiative has impacted us or has changed a little bit the way we see our work. So, briefly, I'll just share that um, I was working on a PhD that I will tell you a bit about what is it, but that was gonna stop before I was able to share a lot of what I've experienced with the committees that I've been working with. So this public scholar initiative has radically changed the how am I gonna be um, 
mobilizing uh, my PhD. So I have a background in forest engineer, engineering and agriculture engineering, but in my PhD I started looking at how people relate to the forest. So currently I've been looking at how differently people benefit from community ecotourism projects. And I've been looking at gender differences and ethnic differences in two communities in Ghana, in West Africa. And uh, the way I've been also looking at this research is seeing how social networks and social capital can help us articulate why men and women or people from local ethnicities or not local ethnicities benefit differently from community ecotourism projects in their own hometowns. So through this public scholar initiative, um, I've been able to uh, design a knowledge mobilization plan that I wasn't going to be able to do earlier, even if I wanted to do it and I was planning in doing it on the side, um, but with a lot of pressure and frustration because there's no time to do this in a PhD, it's not valued, it's more valued a publication, things like that. I didn't have funding to go back to Ghana, etc. So uh, in the past year I've been working with the communities to discuss what would be a good way for me to come back and share and how could we have a discussion of my results and what I think would be the implications and that that feeds again into my own uh, research. So I'm going to be writing an extra chapter in my dissertation that it's going to be um, uh, the process of knowledge mobilization. And as I see now that I'm in the middle of it, uh, the entanglements and the ethical dilemmas and many, many personal issues around what does it mean to be a public scholar? What does it really mean when you realize that what you are doing is not only going to be published and maybe a few people will read it, but really you're going to hear back from the people that are going to be um, uh, affected or listening to your results. So this is bringing a lot of ethical dilemmas which I think are hugely important and undervalued in when we do research and also a huge accountability and responsibility for the kinds of research that we are doing. So a lot of um, movement in my brain and in my uh, life and but at the same time I'm hugely uh, grateful for the opportunity. And then um, another thing, I had a note here. Um, so I've received like not only economical support to be able to travel there and also to be able to develop these ideas here, but um, through the network we've met people from different disciplines but doing research maybe in a similar context. Or I met a person doing research in Ghana and through that I've started realizing how differently we have prepared ourselves to go to Ghana. and how through these differences I'm starting to realize much more um, what is my role as a researcher and what does it mean to do research that uh, goes beyond my own selfish whatever accomplishment of having a title or something like that. And this is the platform. I wouldn't have been able to do it. Um, I wouldn't have found the support um, to do it and being in the network makes you realize that you're not alone in this process of trying to figure out, so what, with your PhD, yeah? So, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, the Public Scholar Initiative enabled me to collaborate with um, a really cool nonprofit organization called Island Institute. It's on the coast of Maine in the US, which is where I'm originally from. And um, perhaps in contrast to most PhD students, my entire PhD career, I have been deeply ambivalent about whether or not I want to pursue an academic career. And that's coming from both like the, the realities of the job market and how like only 30% of PhD students go on to get academic careers. Um, also personal experience, I worked in really cool nonprofits before I started grad school and in the back of my mind I always thought, you know what, I think I just want to go back to the nonprofit world and be a project manager. So this past summer um, I was based in Rockland, Maine, 
thanks largely to this initiative and the funding that was associated with it to make my my simple lifestyle on my dad's sailboat possible. <laughs> so I was camping out on the sailboat and rowing into work, which was pretty cool. Um, and I worked with Island Institute and I worked closely with a collaborator there, Suzanne McDonald. And um, it was really interesting working with her because she was about the same age as I was, only she had definitely gone on the, like, got a master's in planning and then gotten a job. And she's, a rock star. Like she had so much energy and she was involved in a million things and very well connected with the um, Renewable Energy Lab and the Department of Energy in the US. And um, she's just like go, go, go kind of person. And during the course of my summer experience there, I both realized like, wow, I really have learned something in grad school that I can offer and that is useful for other people. And it made me a little bit more grateful for how much time we have to reflect on things because as I worked with Suzanne McDonald, she's just on the go all the time, putting out fires and dealing with interesting but complicated political relationships. And she just did not have the time to like sit down and write things and process information, which is like what I've been doing for the last four years of my life. So. It was personally really good for me to um, like kind of be embedded in this organization for a couple of months to make me appreciate what I have in grad school, but also make me more aware of what I have to offer people outside of academia. So um, in the course of the summer, I worked very closely with her and she just it was kind of like a download for her, like telling me about like what's worked with their different community engagement strategies in relation to uh, developing renewable energy and specifically um, solar and mostly wind renewable energy on various islands in New England. Um, so I was able to help her like download this information and then categorize and sort and try to like make sense out of this barrage of knowledge that she and other people in the organization had. And we worked very iteratively back and forth to write a report that I think is in very accessible language, although I tried to write my first blog post in accessible language and FA came back to me with many places to revise it. And in the end, it, it, it's much better after all of the back and forth we had. So I appreciated that. And in any case, um, with Island Institute, we wrote a report together. And um, it was a good reminder of how important it is to be connected to what I call boundary organizations, organizations that can be bridges between, um, you know, policymakers and uh, communities and helping to represent the interests of community members to policymakers, um, And I felt like I was kind of bridging academia and the NGO world in bringing in my, the various theoretical lenses that I had from my PhD process and being like, oh yeah, this relates to your community engagement work. So I felt like we learned a lot from each other and it really just, in a concrete way made me feel more like useful in the short term which was really satisfying for me because I often feel like in academia we spend years refining these publications and um, we don't get as much direct immediate feedback about the work that we're doing so uh, with Island Institute we came out with this report I'm currently um, using a lot of the insights and, and writing from the report and trying to like convert it into a more academic um, chapter of my dissertation. Um, and I also was able to, um, Island Institute asked me to present at a conference that they organized and there is like the former governor of the state there who's really involved in renewable energy development. And I also got to interact with some state representative staff members who were there. So I don't think my academic research would ever have gotten in the ears of those kind of people who really are at the cusp of like changing energy policy um, if I had only done academic research. Um, so it was cool to get a broader audience and um, I also was invited to be a speaker in a webinar that they hosted and it was funded by the Department of Energy and um, 
I'm not sure how many people watched the webinar, but again, that was like uh, expanding the audience for my research in a really big way. Um, and now, like, as I move forward, I think um, I could still go either way, the academic or not academic track, but I feel like I have a more concrete idea of what both of those entail and about the skills that I could offer to both. And I also, I had a really good conversation with one of the women at Island Institute who's, um, she's, I think, uh, just below the executive director. She got a PhD in oceanography, but then went on to like help to lead a nonprofit organization. And her, we had this conversation one day during the summer and she basically was like, you know what, you can make a difference no matter which track you go in, whether it's academia or NGO or government. And like the important part is that you can put your, your brain and your heart behind it. And um, I really got that experience this summer, so. Thank you, PSA. Thanks so much to you both. Um, I'm going to go through a bit more um, information and then um, we'll have questions, including for Analia and Sarah. Okay, so um, the first thing I want to mention is that, so obviously there's an application to become a member of the Public Scholars Initiative. You can apply to be a member with or without funding. So you don't have to need funding to apply to become a member of the initiative and be a part of the network and, and be part of the professional development opportunities and academic support. So I'm assuming most of you will want to apply for funding, but you don't have to. Um, you can just apply for, for the initiative itself. And so for everybody who wants to apply, there's some basics, kind of standard uh, scholarship uh, type information. Uh, so just the basics, um, there's, and there's a form for this online. FA can bring it up on, online, show you where it is. Um, we do need you to fill out the Canadian Common CV. How many of you know what that is? Not everybody does. If you don't, uh, that's okay. Um, it's a online CV service um, and the instructions for the application give you quite clear directions of how to do that and, and what scholarship to select um, in the CV that you're applying for. Um, we require a statement of purpose and this is a little bit different than just sort of a research statement of purpose. This is where we want you to tell us how your work links to the goals of the PSI that we've been talking about, um, about uh, publicly engaged work, work that has a positive social contribution, um, unique forms of scholarship that, are expand, that uh, expand your um, dissertation work. So make sure that you read carefully again, and the information is on the website, what the goals of the PSI are, and tell us how your work uh, is related to those goals. Uh, we also need a short proposal of your scholarly work. So that should include kind of the, res the overall arc of your research project that you've been working on or intend to work on in your PhD, and include um, any additional or supplementary scholarly type work that you intend to um, uh, integrate with, with your, your research. Uh, we do need a letter of support and engagement from your supervisor. So um, what, this, what we're looking for here is not just your supervisor saying that you're a great student, but your supervisor saying that they support you in um, you know, doing something perhaps a bit innovative, a bit different than just you know, the core academic publications or whatever would normally be part of your dissertation, but that they're behind you putting in the time and effort to um, do this publicly engaged uh, scholarship work. Uh, for those of you who already have a, a collaborator, a collaborating agency or group or organization, or are hoping to have one, uh, we would ask that you supply a letter from that organization as well. Uh, some of you may already be very um, involved with a partner or some of you are, might just take this as an opportunity to reach out to a partner and, and propose um, a project. 
Um, so if, if you can, if you have a letter and you have a relationship where you can get a letter that's supportive of this, great. If you don't, uh, it's not strictly a necessity for your application. Any questions on the components of the application? Yeah. How do you conceive the innovation part of it? I'm asking this because there are certain areas that are more innovative than others per se. For example, if you're trying to, I don't know, come up with some new um, uh, cure for cancer, it's mm -hmm. obviously going to be very innovative. Mm -hmm. But if you are working within a field that you know is very old but still within within that field, what you want to do is kind of new. Mm -hmm. You know that might look different in terms of different in terms of uh, the innovation part of it. Mm -hmm. But to my eyes, or close to reality, what do you think? I think my response to that is really we need you to tell us what how it's an innovation or how the way you're approaching it is innovative. Um, we don't have like a set definition of what innovation is. It doesn't have to be technological innovation or, or what have you. you. You need to tell us how this is sort of expanding what a doctoral dissertation would normally do in your field or how it's pushing something in your field forward in terms of its engagement with the communities that are affected. Um, it's hard for me to give you a specific answer, but it's, we just we want you to tell us. Yeah, I was thinking about it because part of the uh, doctoral dissertation's expectation is that you create something new. Yeah. So. Yeah, so I think by it? innovative we mean in part um, it goes beyond kind of maybe ivory tower research. It it, it engages with some some public whether that's a community, whether that's an organization, whether it's a company, that it has an engagement um, beyond just strictly your academic field of other academic researchers. And then possibly presents the work in an innovative way, like F.A. was giving some examples, like including a policy paper or a film or um, a portfolio of some kind that makes um, your dissertation, that presents the knowledge you've created in a way that is maybe distinctive and innovative than, you know, the typical just 300 page dissertation, you know, introduction, you know, uh, res uh, literature review methodology, but kind of o opens the door a little bit to unique and innovative ways of engaging your audiences. Hi. Hi, so regarding the proposal of scholarly work, uh, do you mean like a work published in journals or could it be like um, filmmaking or what's, what's the research, what do you mean by research that like, could be creative research or research published in journals? For your proposal? Yeah, the proposal of scholarly work. It's the work that you want to do. And in our view, it doesn't have to be, um, by we, we called it scholarly work purposely to, to make it broad. Mm -hmm. uh, we could consider a policy paper being scholarly mm -hmm. um, or, or a film being done in a scholarly way. Um, it doesn't have to be a research article or something that would end up in a typical academic journal. like Analia's knowledge mobilization plan. You know, she's approaching that in a scholarly way, but it's, that itself wouldn't be a research article in a journal, I'm assuming. Well, it could it be? Yeah, well, maybe it could be, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the external collaborations, does it have to fit in the public part of the program, or is it okay if it's uh, for expanding the technical part of the program? Um, I think it's, well, I'm not sure I understand the question. Can so you help me? So for instance, there is a technical product, for instance, a study of cell or uh, engineering, mm -hmm. and it fits into this application because there is a public side as well. But yeah. the collaboration is very technical, like improving that system or that technology. Do you find it uh, relevant to this? Uh, 
Uh, I think so if it's, if it's working in a collaboration to advance, to advance your goals and that there is some sort of um, public benefit or engagement emerging from your work. Ultimately. Yeah. U ultimately emerging from your work. But if it's, you know, a, a tech company that's going to help you build something that then, you know, that advances your work in that, in that realm, I, that's great. That's great. But I saw another hand. <coughs> okay, I'll go on for now. Um, for, those, for those of you who are requesting funds, um, you will need to provide a budget as well, and this is part of the application form. Um, so we need to know what you're requesting, up to $10,000, how you plan to use it, um, and specifically what you, you intend to use it for during the funding period. Um, if you are asking for stipend support, we need other information about um, other funding that you might have. Okay? So we don't have enough money for everybody and we kind of want to make sure that we're we want to make sure that we're providing money that will facilitate you doing work that you couldn't do otherwise. So we need to know about your other funding. Uh, you have plenty of time to work on these applications. Deadline isn't until May 16th. Um, like I said, we have the form and instructions on the website now. It's, it's open. Uh, uh, yeah, the following slide will tell you where to send it. But, uh, th so this is the, the selection criteria. So for all applicants, um, we, you know, we want to know about your past scholarly achievement. Did, did I forget, did we ask for transcripts? No, we don't. Yeah, so we don't need your transcripts, but we'll get this from your CV and from your statement and from, from le letters of support. Um, you know, like all uh, proposals, we want to know that yours is well-developed, it has a scholarly basis, um, that it's uh, reasonable, that what you want to do can be completed within the proposed time frame, that it's a good fit with the aims of the initiative. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, we really will be looking for those students who have a plan from the start to um, integrate the publicly engaged scholarship work into the fabric of your dissertation. We know that in some fields that's harder to achieve than others. We, we really do understand that. But um, we're, we're very eager to support students who are, who are willing to kind of think out of the box with that and, and, and have the support of their supervisor to do it. It's not a total deal breaker, but I can tell you that that's something we're very interested in seeing. Um, where am I? If, if you have an established relationship with an engagement partner, that's definitely a plus. It gives us a sense that there's a real, uh, a, a real plan to engage and a real pathway to move this into the, to the public interest. Uh, we also will be looking in, in making our choices to have a diverse range of academic fields, right? So uh, we will be kind of trying to, um, you know, ensure we have good representation for many different fields in our cohort. Um, and again, for those requesting funding, um, uh, we, uh, like I said, we really want to make sure that we're, we're providing funds that will make a real difference, that will really make you able to do something that you couldn't do otherwise. So it, it has no alternative funding source. And of course, the budget needs to be well-defined and, and rationalized. Any questions here? Our, I'm in IRES, our department uh, has a lot of very engaged people, but we're also from many different disciplines and, and also very much in between disciplines. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about how you would deal with us in the diverse representation category? Um, that's a good question. Um, you know, there are some graduate programs that are kind of more akin to this whole viewpoint in general, and, it, and that showed in, in who we selected in this past year. We had several students from RMES, IRES, Forestry. Um, I think that, well, I don't know. Do you want to take this? I think the, 
One of the broader aims of this is really culture change. And um, we, do, we do want to encourage people, as Jenny said, to think outside the box. So in applied disciplines, it's a little bit less of a leap. And we want to encourage those for sure, but we also want to maybe particularly encourage those for, which, for whom it is a, a much larger leap. And just to say, this is possible. Um, so that's We're looking we for our first PSI scholar in math. <laughs> <laughs> <That's right>. Or <laughs> philosophy, or it's... <laughs> But, you know, we're looking for great projects and great students across the board. But we, we will be trying to, yeah. Hi. Uh, no, we're not necessarily, no, we're not saying the whole PhD, but the, the project, um, I think you should lay out what you would want to accomplish with the year of funding. I think that's the best way to put it. Um, so we want to see that that's realistic. And if, you know, some of you might be in your first or second year, you may, you know, there might be a lot still to figure out. But um, I think you should propose work that you think you can accomplish in, with the year of funding. With, you know, with the knowledge that, you know, uh, Ideally, you'd be able to get a second year of funding for this to complete the project and if we have the money to give. Yeah? So you said that you have enough funding for 30 people, but how many people that are not receiving funding are you allowing in? Yeah, so last year we, there was just uh, two or three, I think, who didn't get funding who we brought into uh, the, the <coughs> network. Um, I'm not sure for this year if we might um, expand we'll that have, or we'll not. We'll have to play it by year, I think, we'll see how many applications we get. So I can't give you a number here. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Could you, for example, apply and say in your application, if I get the funding, I'm going to use it in, I don't know, between 2017 and 18? Because that's the time you are planning to for example, conduct your field work, yeah. let's say. It's, it's meant to be used during the 2016-2017 academic year. Okay. Yeah. There is room for extension? There is room for an ex extension if, you know, something happens and your time frame goes off a little, but we wouldn't, you know, grant you now for work that you're going to be doing, a, you know, another year later. We're, we're crossing our fingers for... Uh, funding next year, so if it's for next year, then we could. So those of you who may not feel like you're at the point in your project where you could, where you would really use the money next year, I would still suggest that you apply and you can become part of the network and get connected with us and, you know, hopefully we can keep going with this and then you can apply for funding the, the following year after that. Yes. That's a good question. I'm sure, actually, most of you are probably sitting there going, does what I want to do fit in, into this? You know, is this the right match for it? And, you know, we can stay afterwards and you can talk with us about your projects and we can try and give you a sense of whether it's what we kind of have in mind. But in general, it's... Um, I think the way we've been thinking about it is that this will enable you to extend the, the research work that you want to do into a stronger engagement with the public that you feel is affected by your work, or a public that you feel is affected by your work. So 
you might be, um, do you want to give the example of Jennifer Wan as an example of, of work that was kind of an extension? Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that's quite what, I'm trying to think of what I quite understand your question. Um, you're saying it's maybe part of your dissertation anyway? <coughs> Yeah. And, and can you support that? Yeah, um, I guess I'm too curious in short. Do we need to add something new on top of our current project? Well, if your current project already looks like a public scholar project and you, and you need some funding to help support that, I think that would be okay, would you say? Yeah, yeah, and I mean, we're, as this is a pilot, we're kind of even evolving our own thinking about mm -hmm. what it should be as well. But we've heard some of our current scholars say, okay, I'm doing my research and then for my public scholar component, I'm doing this. And we kind of don't want there to be like a separate public scholar project. We want it to, we, we, we want it to be an integrated part of the scholarly work that you're trying to do. And if it is already for you, that's great. You do, it, this doesn't have to be an add-on. Other questions? Any questions for these two? Yeah. I had a question for, for Sarah. You talked to the, it was really interesting, so what you learned with that collaboration with the nonprofit. I'm curious, when you were doing the application before you did all that, what was kind of your rationale for doing Like, Did you think you were going to learn those things? Like, or how did you kind of pitch? Or was that even the, the, how you pitched as part of the application? Uh, I knew that I was interested in learning and doing research about community engagement and renewable energy and like decision processes related to renewable energy. I also, there's personal things that came in, like I wanted to spend more time with my family after living so far away for so long. And the technology that I'm fascinated in happens to be uh, emerging in a place that is near my family. So it was just a, an alignment of all sorts of different factors and um, that I, pr I proposed to collaborate. I had already seen an article about the work that this group had done, and I was like, wow, that hits on all the key words that I'm interested in. I want to meet these people. So did you already have a did you already have a connection with the Island Institute when you applied? I think I had started an email emailing them back and forth saying I was I was looking for multiple funding sources to fund an internship with them, mm -hmm. and um, this was a great opportunity for that. Okay. Um, I have a question for Anna. This, you can tell us more about some of the actual on this that you mentioned. Could you, could you repeat the question? Um, yeah. So Molly is asking me if um, I could speak a bit more about the ethical dilemmas. Um, and so one of the things that I'm saying is that um, in my PhD, just intellectually, I was trying to understand some of the key components of empowerment and social capital, and all very intellectually thinking, oh, and well, this will impact communities. And in a chapter, at the end of your thesis or your paper, you say practical implications. And you start saying a lot of things that come from your mouth or your brain very easily. Uh, without really seeing like how does this actually be on the ground? Or what would the impact be if I go to a community and I say, hey, uh, your women are going to think less. Uh, bye. <laughs> that, all of that was like, it makes me hugely uncomfortable. Who am I to say that? Uh, did I interpret this properly? Yes, I followed these scientific methods and all of these stats, but what are the consequences of doing research? Am I extracting research? Am I extracting knowledge so that I get a degree? Um, how selfish is that? Um, how can I, a person from Spain, studying in Canada in a second language, go to Ghana and do that? <laughs> so there, there are a lot of layers that once you start, once you dare to get outside the comfort zone of a paper, which is very painful, but it's a comfort zone with high different kind of words, how that um, 
like, I don't know, like slaps on the face of the researcher to see that we are accountable, we must be held accountable. And we have a huge responsibility, we have a huge privilege for being in this university doing this research. Um, so all of this is like some some of the evening crying or like I shouldn't be doing this research, like a lot of that. And I think that this is necessary because uh, we keep publishing papers without really understanding the impacts, which we, if we would understand the impacts or get a sense of that, we may be asking different questions. And then the questions that are more catering to the needs of the people who came to do research for. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot more. <laughs> Any more questions uh, for the group? Yeah. Um, and I don't know if this is best directed to the scholars or to you guys. Um, so, being <coughs> about a, just over a year and a half into this PhD process, like, I feel like I'm just getting to the point where I'm actually producing anything of value, and I am having a hard time thinking of how I would possibly grow my supervisor and be like, so I know I'm only finally just useful to you, but now I want to like go do this other thing for. You know, like, you know, leave for four months on internship or whatever, you know, and go work on this other thing that isn't going to result in papers with your name on it. And, like, I don't know how you, if there's any tips or ideas on how you approach your supervisor uh, to say that you have this really cool idea, but you don't know how they're going to feel about it. Well, personally, my goal is to have that research be a chapter of my dissertation and count towards the things that I need to check out my boss is to graduate. So I'm really trying to like shape it into part of the meat of my dissertation. Is there a way that your supervisor, I'm not sure if I caught all you said, but is there a way that your supervisor could be involved in that so that it's not just you doing off and doing something, but it's actually a, a broader yeah, collaboration? Yeah, I don't really, I very much came today without any ideas. That but that's, I mean, that would be one, awesome. one way, um, just to, that it's really a collaboration, it's not just you know, Appeal to his identity as an educator. <laughs> Is it not his or her? Her. <laughs> her. Not just as a researcher, but as an educator, and that this is part of your education and this is part of your formation uh, as, a, as a scholar. I mean, I'm sure you'll have to still make good on the research productivity that she's expecting uh, from you. Um, but it's, you know, it's also, it could also be a way for her to attract more interesting, innovative students if, you know, if her students are doing interesting and innovative things. And there's a lot of, uh, we've talked about a lot of publicity that this gets, that the students get. And if, again, if that's related to <coughs> the broader goal of the research program, that would be a benefit. Could we add to the application a letter from a committee member in addition to the supervisor? No objection. I have no objection. <laughs> I have no objection to, to doing that. But not instead of your supervisor. No, no, no in addition. Yeah. I think the computer died, um, but there was, um, it, it showed on there the email address to send your application materials to, but all of that's on the website as well. And I'll be following up with an email uh, uh, with the slides and also uh, the links uh, mm -hmm. so that you can uh, follow them back. Thank you. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, F.A. and Susan and I will stick around for a little while if you want to chat. Thanks a lot for coming and good luck. Yes.